Welcome everyone. Adam the Woo here as the recording of this Monday, November 28, 2022. I have found myself in Fern Park, Florida at a location that I used to frequent many, many times in the mid 90s. Now has been bulldozed, erased from existence, some would say. I would say Doc Brown would say. The station in Fern Park is where I saw Green Day for the first time in March, I believe it was. Don't quote me on that. I saw them twice in 1994, once at the Edge Concert Field downtown Orlando. That was after Longview was released on MTV and Dookie just completely took over the airwaves. But before that, they had not released the music video yet. In fact, Billy Joe talked about that on the stage that was in this little venue right over here. Now what brings me up to this neck of the woods is because I heard the High Life Fronton, which is basically an arena for High Life. It was like a, a gambling, I think there's still a couple Frontons that are still open. That has since closed after decades of being open. And that kind of struck my interest and I thought to myself, self, that is right next to where I saw Green Day. So came up here, gonna show this, talk about some memories, show the fronton for High Lie, and then also Altamont Springs is right next to Fern Park. Gonna show some stuff over there and just see where the, the day leads. Join me, shall you? It's very interesting visiting a place that you have memories of from the past that is just completely gone. I believe the back door was around here where the bands would load their stuff in. Gosh, I probably saw 50 bands here. Probably frequented this place at least 20 times. You know, three, four, five bands on each bill. Really was not big of a place. You could see it was smaller than the grassy area. So just figure, it was right here in the middle. Probably the most notable would have been that Green Day show, Tilt, opened up. But I also saw a lot of other bands. Agnostic Front, Voodoo Glow Skulls, Screaming Cheetah Willies. I saw Collective Soul. Fun fact, I saw Collective Soul here. Collective Soul pretty much got their start at an Orlando radio station. I think an Orlando rock station back in the 90s was the first station to start playing them before they went national. So they'd, they kind of had some ties to Orlando and they played on a stage. A stage would have been kind of right about here. Give or take right about here. Front door was over there. There's the high lie. That Green Day, you know, so many times I stage dove off this stage. A lot of punk rock shows here as well. And fun fact, my buddy Jason, who some refer to as King Woovian, he went with me to that show and stage dove up here. In fact, he jumped up on stage. This is a fun, fun story about him. He jumped up on stage, which would have been right about here. And the song was about to start, thought the music was gonna continue and he was gonna stage dive during the song and then Billy Joe looked at him and said, what are you doing up here? The song's not even happening. So it was like an awkward thing. And then he staged dope to no music. It was like, right, I don't, just, I don't know. It's just funny how memories come back to you. It's also very peculiar when, you know, bands that are known as being like stadium arena rock bands now, huge bands or bands that you saw earlier in their career when there was really hardly anyone. It was maybe a couple hundred people at the show. There was no like, there was no wall there. There was no like personnel behind there stopping you from getting up on stage. You could just jump up on stage if you so choose. It's kind of, you know, Green Day, Bleak 182, those bands I saw quite a few times before they went to kind of the next level and saw it a lot of places that were this small. But just always interesting to think about seeing a band like that in a place like this, that, you know, the band was just right in front of you. They were pretty much on the same level as you were. Well, just a little bit elevated so you get up on up on stage, do a little stage dive, which I don't even think people can stage dive anymore. Everything is so secure anymore. But yeah, it all happened right here. Now I'm gonna walk over to the old Fronton, which I'm very curious about seeing what has happened to that. But before walking over there, just gonna show, oh yeah, you can see here the pavement here where the entrance was. There was like an awning and you walked in this way, then turned this direction, and then the stage was right here. So the wall was here. And then the stage was right here. And if memory serves me correct, you'd be standing on the edge of the stage right here. 
looking out this way, and there would be a little dance floor. I think the bathrooms might have been over there. And then over on this side was like a little bit of an elevated bar area that had some seats. Even though the bar was in the back, it kind of continued and wrapped around that way. But this was the stage, and I don't know, maybe 10, 15 yards from where the grass ends is where the back of the club ended. There are a heck of a lot of Lynx buses right there, like a little bus station. I had the opportunity of going inside the High Life Fronton five or six, seven years ago, eh, give or take a year. I went to a wrestling event inside there. It was open for WrestleMania weekend. I was not part of WrestleMania, but re during WrestleMania, there are always subsidiary projects and smaller offset wrestling that takes place. And one of them happened in here, and I got to see a wrestler who I have since learned to kind of appreciate some of the stuff he does. His name is Darby Allen named after two punk rock guys, Darby Crash from the Germs and Gigi Allen, of course. Gigi Allen really kind of needs no introduction. But yeah, that wrestler has gone on to kind of other things, but he was right in here doing a, a wrestling match. Oh, I hear someone over there with a leaf blower. Over there next to the road. Oh no, it's, it's, a, it's a hedge trimmer. <laughs> It's now a church, Journey Church. No longer any wrestling events or High Lie. I'll be no gambling going on in here either. High Lie always kind of confused me, a very, very speedy sport, but never really took off too much. There are, there are some people who really liked High Lie, but it really didn't take off, I think as much as, or at least in this generation, they've all kind of, kind of faded away. Now, there is a, there was a fronton in the panhandle of Florida that was closed off and sitting empty. 10 years ago, I got inside of it, did a whole video. One of the scariest closed places I had ever been in, in my life. There were birds in there, it was dark, couldn't see anything. This one's in a lot better condition because this, this is still currently used. See, there's actually something happening in there right now. The Journey Church. No lot, man, this, this changed over quick. I tried getting in, tried going inside, and there were people in there, but they said that they were closed right now, so I don't know what they got going on, but I was gonna see if I could kind of walk around. The escalator that led up to the top floor still looked the same, but yeah, wasn't allowed to look around. I tried. It is good this is being used, however, instead of just sitting empty for a business that closed. The old lamp post up there, for the old lights. And a satellite dish, an old satellite dish over on the side. So yeah, better a, better a building gets used than just sit empty. All right, I'm gonna move on, see what else I can find. This is kind of neat. This little entryway into the station, you can still see where the two poles are there, and the two palm trees that lead in, and then the cinder blocks around the two poles. little remnants of the station here and over there. Found an old photo as well I can show. No dumping allowed. Here's that photo I was referring to. So you kind of see how it has the little awning protrudes out from the rest of the building. That's where, it's still visible today where the awning kind of protruded out. Very unique retro looking station sign, little billboard above the building itself. And you got that little sports car pulling up in front there. But where the awning was still kind of matches up and where the building was. This would have been that angle. So where those cars were parked, so sports car parked here and all the other cars here and that retro sign right there. Awning here. Just like that. It's good that old photos exist, you know, from back in those days because without those, just be in everyone's memory. You just Even just one photo sometimes at a place makes a huge difference. Just having one or two photos of something from back in the day makes a big difference with lining stuff up. As I was walking back over here, going over to my car, it uh, all came back to me now another time. I was over here, got here really early to see a band. I didn't even know what, who they were, but they were called Stick. The album was Heavy Bag. They were all out here with all their road cases and whatnot. 
I hung out with them for a few hours and then saw them play. I don't know, just seeing this little spot right here kind of jarred my memory on that. I don't know, even know whatever happened to that band. That was probably the only time I ever saw them or even heard of them. And I don't even know why that even like, like flashed into my memory, but I remember it vividly now. And something else just popped into my head. Something that Philly Captain, shout out to the Philly Captain, could approve of. I saw the Dead Milkmen, Dead Milkmen from Philadelphia, right in here. I got to see them playing all the hits. Big Legend in my backyard. Also, Bitch and Camaro was probably the most violent slam dancing mosh pit I've ever like seen. There's only maybe like 200 people in here, 150, 200 people crammed in here. But when they played that song, my mind was blown. It was awesome. Possum Dixon, also another band that probably no one's heard of. They opened up this show. Did not even think about that till I was walking back over through here and then I thought, I can't not mention that show. Amazing. All right, moving. Oh, here's an electrical box. This powered the station in Fern Park. Right here, look at this. Then again, maybe it didn't power this. It's a possibility it wasn't powered. There's a power out power thing there. Well, maybe it did. Yeah, this right here could have gone from here over to the station. Now, of course, anyone from this area that visited this venue is going to be enthralled the fact that I'm showing this. Everyone else is going to be like, eh. Pretty neat to me though. It's pretty neat to me. All right. Got back in my car. I found the album Heavy Bag by Stick and I started listening to it. And the first few riffs of the guitar reminded me a little bit of Quicksand and the band Quicksand. And all of a sudden it came back to me also. Another show I went to here was Quicksand opening act Seaweed, two amazing acts. But I'm excited because the stick band is, you know, you can find stuff online. So I started listening to that. I haven't even got halfway through the first song and it just kind of reminded me, just the guitar, the riff of Quicksand. I saw Quicksand and Seaweed here. And a treasure trove of bands that I saw inside here. And more will probably pop in my head, but yeah. Good times, all right, moving on. Made about a mile commute, but into a different town, different community, even though it's, you know, not too far from where I just was. I'm technically now in Altamont Springs, right here at this property, which it is said to have the world's largest nativity set. Anywhere in the world, self-proclaimed. But I'm noticing that they are really starting to tear a lot of the property out. For example, see some heavy machinery over there. Then there's also this deer laying down there, this plastic deer that has fallen on its side. Not a real deer, it's plastic that's fallen over. But up here is that rather large nativity set, and it is ginormous. This ties into the holidays and Christmas. You got the wise men there with their frankincense and myrrh. I mean, this is probably a good 15 feet tall. This wise man. The angel, maybe a good 17 to 20 feet tall. You got Joseph and Mary, and the baby Jesus here. And the star of Bethlehem up top, measuring 19 feet tall, okay. This set is two feet taller than the largest nativity set currently recorded in the world located in Mexico, listed on the quote Guinness Book of World Records. So this is the tallest, largest nativity set in the world, besting that of the Guinness Book of World Records, believe it or not. I have never seen a nativity set this big before. It's pretty awesome.
cross streets of Amanda Street and Jackson Street, right there. And you got the three crosses. These are kind of obscured by the trees, but three of them there. And a lion here and a fountain. Even Big the Foot, he was just saying he does not ever recall seeing a nativity that big before. And the next property over, take a look at this. It's kind of like, you know when you go to the Haunted Mansion, at least in California they have, they might have it here too. I'm just gonna drive by this real sea and see if the eyes of Jesus stay on me. Kinda do. Yeah, kinda works. Neat. And now over to another area, another city. Winter Park. I've always heard this was this only like maybe four or five miles away from where I just was. I think there's a birdhouse up here in this tree. I've always heard of the American Flag House, but I've never stopped off to see it. But I figured since I was in this area, I probably should. Take a look at this. This house is painted like the American flag. Got the flagpole here, flag up there. Some sandbags around the side. Little windmill out front. Little dog over here. <laughs> oh yeah, no worries. Just check it. Is this your house? It's my friend's. Oh, okay. It was his dad's. Oh, okay. He was in the military, and they basically took away all of his benefits, and he served 26 years, like, a really dangerous thing. Yeah, so he painted the house like this? Yeah, it's like a protest. Okay. They love America. This, people think it's an upside-down flag house, and it's not. Okay. They actually love America. Here you go. You got it? Okay, so the guy that lived here has passed on, but they've kept the house painted like an American flag. Got the Bill of Rights here. Someone just pulled up to talk to me. Says he's friends with the current owner, but I guess the guy who originally painted the house passed away. It's kind of funny though, in the old days, the city of Winter Park used to like throw ballistic on them. Oh really? Actually believe it. Upside down flag house at Winter Park. It's the number one tourist destination. The, the this, number? And the scenic boat tour. It's been like this for 30 or 40 years. All right. It's pretty funny. Well, thanks for the info. Yeah, he even did this whole park, landscaped it. Oh really? It was just grass, yeah. Oh, so he did all this too? Yeah. Thanks for the info. Yeah, he's trying to get him to uh, put up a memorial for his dad, and then he'll paint the house. All right, he said that it was okay to take some photos. So I was just informed this has been painted like this since 1978. In this neighborhood since 78. That was four years after I was born. Um, you'll, you'll see the whole story. How tall is the flagpole now? It's 35 feet. So it used to be three feet, three times that high. Yeah, we had a 20 by 30 foot flag on it. Wow. But uh, we, we flew it upside down as a distress signal. What you're doing is you're calling all Americans to your aid as the crisis was being flown. Right. Before they had radios and stuff, they had uh, they used it as a distress signal. You know, your boat was sinking, you turn the flag upside down, people come and rescue you. And that was the way we were using it. We've always been respectful of it. We never, you know, 
the disrespect to them. So, of course, the city didn't, the county didn't like it, and they, uh, they threw us all in jail at one time. All right, just had a nice conversation with the now owner, the son of the guy who used to be here named Grover Walker. He said that I could just search that name and find all the info. Very interesting though, he was saying this flagpole, which is now 35, 33 or 34 feet tall, used to be 100 feet tall, and that caused a major problem with the city and whatnot. So picture this flagpole, which is three times, well, let's say two times the size of the house itself. Multiply that times, so like a skyscraper tall flagpole. Very fascinating, very interesting, to say the least. This house has been painted like this since 1978 in this neighborhood, this very neighborhood here. And I can imagine, you know, I, I didn't really research a lot of this before showing up, but I can imagine that there are probably some in the neighborhood that probably don't want a house painted like that all those years, but still here. Still back there. Made it over to downtown now, downtown Orlando, because it got me thinking when I was over in Fern Park at the station, I got to thinking about a new exhibit well, last time I was here at the Orange County Regional History Center. They were setting up for an exhibit of 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Don't quote me on that. I won't realize it until I get inside, but kind of an earlier history from a couple decades ago of the music scene, the underground, punk rock, indie, emo, all the, you know, all the different labels for it here in town. And I wanted to see if that is open at the moment. It's about 4 p.m., so I would imagine it's probably open till you know, 5 or 6. So I'm going to see what that exhibit is all about inside there. Kind of figured it'd be a good tie-in. I was kind of mentioning some of the concerts I went to back in the day. It's in the old courthouse here. Next to the library. The library is right over here. Over here at this end. I highly recommend this place. Also, they have some of the some old postcards of what Orange Ave used to look like. There's the old courthouse there. That's the 1892 courthouse. But there's a lot of history inside here. In fact, it's called the History Center. Wall Street, right over here. The social, used to be Downtown Jazz and Blues Club over on the Orange Ave, over that way. And the exhibit is known as, oh yeah, so there's a name for it. It's called Music and Mayhem. Right there, it runs a full year. Wow, September to September. So it just started and it goes for a full year. All right, I'm going in. The hours are 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday noon to 5 p.m. Adult admission, $8. All right, I paid the $6 admission fee since it is 4 p.m. and they're closing an hour from right now. They offer a $2 discount, so instead of being $8, it's gonna be $6. This is kinda of neat, these two bears are from a furniture store right over here. So there's a lot, of, a lot of pretty neat history in here. Now the exhibit I'm going to is up on the second floor, up this staircase, up to the second floor. But as stated, there's a lot in here on all the different levels, but I think I have enough time to see what I need to see in here in the time allotted. All right, that was pretty dang cool. Not an exorbitantly large display. It, it takes up a section of the second floor. Not the entirety of the second floor, but a good portion of it. And there are four or five major exhibit areas really leaning into the history of some of these certain venues, all that ring a bell to me during that time frame. you know, during the 90s, you know, early 90s, mid 90s, late 90s, early 2000s kind of stretching through here, like a theming with the flyers on the wall and everything. In fact, some of the flyers ring a bell for me because I went to a lot of these shows, like the Voodoo Glow Skulls Youth Brigade Grey Before My Eyes at Sapphire Supper Club, which also used to be the social, also was the downtown jazz and blues club before that. In fact, there's one flyer for a month that I went to a couple of different shows, like Voodoo Glow Skulls at Youth Brigade, which is on this flyer, and Shyster, which was one of my favorite local bands at the time. I think probably still one of the, probably the best Orlando punk bands and Cosmo Kramers. I remember the singer of the Cosmo Kramers used to have punk shows at his house back in the day. He would have like house shows, which was pretty cool. 
Reverend Horton Heat and Donkey. I went to this show. In fact, I saw Reverend Horton Heat quite a few times in Orlando. And later when I joined the band Guttermouth, we did like a three week tour with the Rev. So I got to know those guys and see those guys perform quite a bit. There's also some artifacts like the guitar case only used by Sonic Youth for the 1988 performance when they played at the Beecham Theater, which is right next to the Downtown Jazz and Blues Club. So they have this on hand as well. And Unwritten Law, Sprung Monkey. I went to this show as well, Unwritten Law. Became friends with the guys in Sprung Monkey. I lived with a guy and they stayed at our house when Sprung Monkey was on the Good Times tour with Blink-182, seven seconds. So later on, you know, I got to know those guys and go to a lot of shows at Unwritten Law. Of course, I really liked it. That's the Unwritten, Unwritten Law flyer. The Ramones, who played, a, well, I didn't realize the date, but it was March 5th, they played at the Edge. I was at this Ramones show. I got to see the Ramones when they were still together, which was like a huge bucket list. I'm really glad to have done that. Belly and Radiohead played at a place called Visage, which is on Orange Blossom Tree, kind of near Fair Fairville Megastore, like past that. It was called Visage, and now it's like a warehouse district. But I got to see Radiohead in a small venue before they got like massively popular. And then also the Dead Kennedys played in Orlando as well. I never even heard of this venue, but the Dead Kennedys back in 1985 played at a place called the Syrian Lebanese American Club. And the promoter ended up set, telling the club that it was going to be a birthday party. Up there. I met a lot of these bands I remember. I didn't go to the Elliott Smith show. I do remember my roommate at the time used to listen to Sunny Day Real Estate quite a bit. Didn't go to the Iggy Pop show, but I went to quite, quite a few of things around here. In fact, we continue this way. I'll show where the Beecham Theater used to be. It's called something else now, and I'll show where the Sapphire and you know, Social Downtown Jazz and Blues Club was. I think I think it's still open. I think it's still open, but it's down Wall Street over under Orange. All right, it is still the Beecham. Beecham right over here. So it's still called the Beecham and the Social right next to us. So you got Social and the Beecham right here on Orange. Now I must admit, in all the years I went to shows back then, a lot of shows around town, The Edge, Visage, Club Nowhere, you know, all, all the ones that I kind of miss at the social, downtown jazz, was I never went to a show at the Beecham. I never did. One that I really regret going to in that time frame was Fugazi played here. For some reason, it slipped past my radar. I never, I never went to it. Now the social, I've been to probably hundreds of shows at. In fact, later when I joined bands, later on in my life, I played in here quite a, quite a few times inside the social. But this whole stretch, I went to a lot of shows. There used to be a venue right here where I saw the Toasters and Murphy's Law. I think it was called Barbarella. I saw Scheister here. Scheister, the, the Orlando punk band, I probably saw 50 times. Probably one of the best Orlando punk bands. And around the back of Barbarella, they used to have an outdoor stage and I saw the Bouncing Souls. I saw a bunch of other bands too, but the Bouncing Souls I really remember the most. Now it's called the Patio back here. And then of course Planet Pizza. After a good punk rock show, a slice of pizza in here was always kind of like the thing to do. Glad to see this place is still open. Kind of funny too. You know, when I was in the band, we'd always park back here. This is where you'd load in and out. The back of the social is over there. You kind of load in that way. I knew there was a rooftop bar between the Beecham and the social, above the social, but I never saw really what was back here. Every time I would load in or go in through the back, I never looked up there to notice the really, I'd never been up in that, in that section before. That's pretty interesting. Right here on the back side of Planet Pizza. Yeah, this brings back a lot of memories. That's the back door over there at the social. Ah, my punk rock days. Long time ago. Made it over onto Mills Avenue now. The new Will's Pub, which is over there. Of course, I say new, it's been there 20 plus years. The other Will's Pub was in a different spot, about a mile down the road. But I remember both Will's Pub. On the corner of Canton and Mills, I typed that address in 1017 Mills. And this pops up, which is now a public storage building. Could have been remodeled. Not sure if this is the original building where Jello and his band could have performed. Now there's a North and South Mills. The South Mills 1017 is a residential area. So I'm pretty confident it's not the South Mills one. It's the North Mills one, which is gonna be on this little stretch of road. So according to the address and according to that flyer that was at the exhibit, this is where they performed right here. In fact, 1017, if you type it into coordinates, is the second little chunk here. So basically starting here and going this way. So since 85, that building where they said they were gonna have a birthday party ended up having one of the craziest punk rock shows, probably one of the craziest punk rock shows in Orlando history. 
took place. Right here. Pretty fascinating. Because here's 10, here's 10 11. This is 10 17. Right here. Right next to Wally's since 1954, Wally's Liquor with this classic neon here. And Rise Above Tattoo. Which is closed today. It's a Monday as a recording of this. They're closed on Mondays. Yeah, right next to Tattoo Shop. According to the flyer, that's the address. Would have been right here. Pretty wild. And then across the way over here is Lou's, which is a underground punk rock bar as well. A lot of bands play in there. I played in there. A lot of bands have played inside there as well. I4 traffic is interesting. It usually runs pretty smoothly, but there's little pockets certain times of the day that are pretty backed up, like right now. The sunset there on the clouds, though, makes it all okay. Made it back to celebration. My elongated shadow. Well, two shadows. There's one here, and then another one, which is a car pulling up beside me. Okay, now the shadows are gone. But that's going to do it for today as I walk around the walking trail around the lake here. Lake Reinhardt. Dark out here now. It was a fun day reminiscing. I always think about reminiscing. I'm very nostalgic. Not only about things that I like, but also things in my life, and memories. Well, I look back on this time frame of my life, 20 years from now, be nostalgic about this also. Will I be as nostalgic about what's happening now as I am about things currently that happened 20 years ago? Does nostalgia ever end? And is there a cutoff point for nostalgia? Or is it something that just happens in my life between a certain time frame? But I'm nostalgic about my extreme younger years, teenage years, and adult life. And I'm nostalgic about stuff that happened 20 years ago. I guess what the answer is, is I don't know. But I'm leaning towards yes. When you're on these bridges through celebration over the swamps, remember, do not feed the squirrels. I think at this hour, though, I don't know, the squirrel, are there squirrels out at this hour? It might be. That's going to do it for today. Thanks for watching. I had no real game plan when I started. Think about certain days, it'll like morph wherever the wind blows or whatever like my mind will think of one thing I'm like I'm gonna go over there and do that. And that's kind of what today was. I appreciate you watching. I do, I'll see you in the next video. The vlog. This vlog is in fact.